Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Seth McGowan, the Vice President of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, and I'll be your host this evening. The Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is proud to present the next installment in our Cygnus series, actually part two of this uh, particular uh, lecture. This is a series of live, virtual, and interactive lectures uh, in a way to encourage and to uh, promote our uh, educational mission during this period of social distancing and limited gatherings. Hopefully we'll be back out of that uh, sooner rather than later, but until then, we'll be going through the middle of October with our Cygnus series, so please be sure to join us for that. Um, we are located in the heart of the Adirondack Park, and you can see uh, our beautiful dark skies and our uh, remote location, high elevation, makes us a perfect place for, uh, for stargazing and for uh, Adirondack science and especially uh, our up and coming Astro Science Center. And there you can see on your screen that, that heart of darkness, I like to call it, the crossroads of the Adirondacks. Tupper Lake is directly in the center of that. So for those of you who might be new our Astro Science Center is currently under development and uh, we are becoming an important destination for all ages in the future. And we can show you a little bit of what's being planned uh, in our Astro Science Center and museum. The numerous interactive exhibits within the museum itself educate and thrill visitors as we continue our exploration into space. In addition to the exhibit hall and continuing with our hands-on approach to astronomy is our makerspace. And that is an interactive learning lab where visitors will engage in virtual reality, telescope making, and everything hands-on astronomy, much, much more too. Our spacious lecture hall will be a great place for large groups to hear about the wonders of space and science. And our premier state-of-the-art digital planetarium will take you on trips beyond your wildest imaginations. So we hope you'll become part of this exciting future by becoming a member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory and uh, consider a gift to help make the Astro Science Center and Museum a reality. And that you can do by clicking on our website on the donate page or contact, uh, contact us directly at info at adirondackskycenter.org. And now on with tonight's show. Before we begin, uh, you'll notice that our microphones are muted. Uh, this is to be sure that uh, we don't have any extraneous noise, but I encourage you to uh, unmute and ask a question or you can raise your hand and I'll interrupt our speaker who I'll introduce in just a moment uh, to ask your question. This is intended to be a, uh, a live and interactive event. So uh, we wanna make sure we preserve that, uh, of course, uh, we'll be Courteous to others, uh, if you need to unmute yourself to ask a question directly, feel free. Tonight's presentation, as well as all of our uh, future and, uh, and of course our past talks, will be available uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you'll be provided with links throughout tonight's uh, lecture in the chat area. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eileen O'Donohue. Uh, most importantly to us, of course, the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. She's a board member. Uh, she's also, in, uh, in her real world, a St. Lawrence University uh, priest professor of, of, of physics. So tonight, as I mentioned, our presentation is part two in a three-part series, Einstein, Gravity, and Multi-Messenger Astronomy. Take it away, Eileen. All right. Let me grab the screen from you there, Seth. And there it is. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the introduction. And just to clear up, what is this priest? It's Henry Priest, uh, who uh, taught physics at St. Lawrence University uh, in the uh, previous millennium. Of course, I taught the previous millennium as well. So he was in the, uh, in, I think he lasted into the 20th century. So uh, uh, the uh, whole series is Einstein, Gravity, and Multi-Messenger Astronomy. And so let me click. Okay, so I've 
uh, broken this into three talks. Part one, Einstein, about Einstein's uh, um, universe, how different it was from Newton's. And that Einstein said that space-time is a fabric or a fluid that can ripple. So tonight is gravity. Um, and I'll talk about gravitational waves, how we detect them. And then part three is going to be on October 9th. Uh, and I'll talk about the detections of, of gravitational waves and the, the detection of electromagnetic waves that happened nearly simultaneously in at least one event. And that gives us multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, the first one's uh, in the can. You can find it on the ASCO uh, YouTube channel. And there's the link. Seth will be giving you the links. And so part two is tonight. So let me just briefly review that according to Einstein, space is a fabric. Space time is a fabric. It's not nothing. It's the structure kind of of the universe in which matter and energy kind of do their thing and becoming, you know, stars and galaxies and puppies uh, and us. Um, and gravitation, if you disturb the space time, just like um, if you, you, you throw a, a you know, a, a, a rock into a pond, you disturb the, the, fa the, the fluid of the pond. The waves aren't just on the surface. They're also in the interior of the pond. There uh, and so gravitational waves propagate like those interior waves in the pond, which are more like the sound waves that are allowing your ears to detect the vibrations in my larynx um, and translate it into English, which is a, a a mystery all of its own. So um, these gravitational waves move at the speed of light, uh, and it's really the the fabric of space time expanding and and contracting, and nothing reflects, refracts, or absorbs them. Uh, unlike, you know, like water waves get stopped in the pool wall. Well, that doesn't happen with gravitational waves. And they're shaped by the physics that creates them. Just like, you know, uh, water waves have particular shapes. Um, uh, the waves that pass through the Earth after an earthquake, they have particular shapes. And so space-time ripples, and our question has been for since uh, you know 1915 when when Einstein and I came up with this, how do we detect these ripples? How can we detect them? So that's what tonight is about. How how we try to de detect them? How we have detected them? So what creates these ripples? Well, it has to be really dramatic changes in large masses. You know when a a flea lands on the water, it doesn't create big waves. And yeah, you, know, you and I in all our lives are barely a flea on the water of the universe. So you need stars exploding, giant stars exploding, converting all this mass into energy suddenly. And that disturbs the fabric or the fluid of space time. Massive bodies falling into black holes. Um, and neutron stars fall into black holes, black holes merge. So these massive collisions, two neutron stars merging to create a black hole, mergers of black holes with each other. We've seen a couple of those. And so all of these events are what can create gravitational waves sizable enough for us to be able to detect them. So if we could see gravity waves passing through the Earth, what would they look like? And this, as it says, the scale of the effect is vastly, oh, I can't find my, there it is. The scale of the effect is vastly exaggerated. So I'm going to play this video, which is from the LIGO Observatory. Well, that's redundant. The O is observatory. It's from the LIGO. And so every meter, every millimeter of the Earth is varying in length in all directions, primarily in the direction perpendicular, uh, in the direction of travel of the wave. So that's what we're trying to detect, this actual expansion and contraction of space-time itself. So the first attempt to detect this was done in the 1960s with this guy, Joseph Weber. And he had these Weber bars. They were one meter diameter, two meter long, aluminum cylinders, and he thought these will be deformed by the gravitational waves and vibrate in, in, in response. 
And so the vibration he was looking for was something like this, this, you know, squeezing as one length got larger and, and smaller. And he claimed detections in 1969 and 1970. These were later disproven. This didn't have, it had no chance of detecting gravitational waves. It's just too small a scale. So then, particularly in the 1980s, they started coming up with a different way to detect these gravitational waves that uses an interferometer. All right, this is based on interference. All interference is, is a fancy word for addition, okay? But we're scientists, we need to use fancy words. So here's a wave and it's added to another wave. And notice on this one, the two peaks line up and the two troughs line up. So the peaks get higher and the, and the um, uh, troughs get deeper. That's constructive interference. They add, they, uh, uh, they add, that's the interference, and they pile on top of each other. Well, if they're misaligned so that we get a crest and a trough and a trough and a crest, then they cancel each other out and it flatlines. That's destructive interference. This turns out to be a really handy thing when it's done with light. So um, we do that. We do this in the lab. If we were in the lecture hall, I would show you this. I would shine a laser through a double slit and on uh, the wall we'd be able to see a series of bright and dark spots and so where it's bright that means the two waves are adding to be uh, higher crests and lower troughs and where there's no light it's where um, they're adding crest to trough and they flatline and it's very similar to the ripples here uh, in, in a pond, and you can see areas where, so here there's a nice ripple, but see it's canceled out right in there. And so uh, this is an everyday phenomenon. Actually, uh, back in August, I was actually at the Hungry Trout doing a little fishing, and I, have, I got in the pool in the morning, and I was the only person in the pool, so I was standing neck deep with my arms outstretched, and the water would get very quiet and I'd poke my fingers up through the surface. And not only could I see the ripples on the surface, but I could watch the patterns of light and shadow on the bottom of the pool and see this very pattern. And it was, it was really cool. I was very excited. My friends came out and thought I, they, you know, they we just confirmed how weird I am. So, uh, this is, what are you doing? Oh, I'm playing with the interference patterns on the bottom of the pool. Okay, so these interferometers. So we have a, a light source and coherent just means that all the light waves that come out are lined up crest to crest and trough to trough. And so they all come out and here they get split. One half of the light goes, uh, bends up to this mirror, half of the light passes through to this mirror. Then they both reflect off their mirrors, they come back. So this one now goes through the, the half-silvered mirror, this one reflects, and they come into the detector. And so there's a, you can vary these paths. If the path difference is a, an integer number of wavelengths, then they'll interfere uh, constructively. They'll still be crest to crest and trough to trough. But if it's a, an integer number of half wavelengths, an odd integer number of half wavelengths, then they'll come back and they'll be crest to trough and they'll cancel each other out. So you'll get these bright and dark spots. Oh man, hit the wrong button. Okay, there it is. And so we use these in the intro physics lab when we're in person and so we can, uh, here's our, our, uh, our light source is I guess here. And so it bounces around on these mirrors and uh, comes out over here. And this is what we see, here are these rings. And so these light and dark fringes, we call them. And so you can move the mirror uh, distances and change the pattern and get very fine adjustments. 
So we have big things. They're much bigger than the, the lab table model in the physics lab. And there's one in Hanford, Washington, and there's one in Livingston, Louisiana. The detectors are not aligned. It's like they don't both have an arm east, west, and an arm north, south. They're at random orientations with respect to north, south, east, and west, and they both have to detect the same gravitational wave ripple within 10 milliseconds of each other because the speed of light between these two uh, means it'd take light 10 milliseconds and the gravitational waves move at the speed of light. So this, these little L's show the orientations of the two interferometers. Uh, and this is what they are. Here's the laser source. It gets focused to a fine column hits the beam splitter, so half the beam goes this way, half the beam goes this way. They can pass through this first one, and then they bounce back and forth, and then they travel four, four kilometers to the other one. So test mass is a mirror, and they're four kilometers apart, and the beam bounces between the two mirrors 280 times. So on a four kilometer path, the beam travels 1120 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long path. And so remember, if that differs by a half a wavelength in its total length, then you get destructive interference. If it varies by one wavelength of the light, you get constructive. Oh. So here's an animation of how this works. So here's our light source, our half silvered mirrors, our two mirrors or half or uh, test masses as they're called at LIGO. And so here's a light beam, it splits, comes back and they meet here. And now it's flashing as these jiggle. All right, let's watch a wave do this so that we can understand the physics of it. And so this wave, it bounces off of this mirror. And remember, it came out, both waves came out of the uh, laser at the same, oriented the same. And now when they come back, they're oriented crest to trough and crest to trough. Mm. So they're canceling each other's out. But as each, um, uh, as each mirror moves a little bit, sometimes they get closer to crest to crest and you see light when they're crest to trough, you don't see light. So a detection, is when we see the right, the, the predicted pattern of brightening and darkening um, on this detector. So that's the, the idea of interferometry or ferometry. So this light travels in vacuum tubes. They're four kilometers long. Over four kilometers, Earth's curvature gives you a one meter drop. So they wouldn't be able to hit the other mirror. So they had to use the GPS system to make sure that these paths were perfectly straight. I guess actually, yeah, they're level, they're, they're, but they don't follow the curvature of the earth. So they're underground. And the, these are 1.2 meters in diameter. So here's a guy. So, you know, uh, it's, you know, what, four feet or something. And it's got a continuous spiral well here. So you can see that spiral. This is all to create stability in this so it doesn't flex. And the other thing is that these are pumped down to one one trillionth of atmospheric pressure. We don't want any air vibrations in there. And we don't want any refraction, any bending of the light beams because of the air. And of course, the main place we see that is in mirages. Because what this says is that between the, the, the light from the, the reflected off the back of this car was headed toward the road, but it got bent by the atmosphere to come up and hit us in the eyeball. That's why we see that coming up at us and we think the road is wet, but it's not. Uh, and so it, it, to get down to that, good a vacuum, one, one trillionth of atmospheric 
pressure. It takes 40 days to pump it down. And the walls on this thing are three millimeters thick. Okay, that's, you know, but that's thick when it's steel and it's spiral welded. And it has to be able to withstand the stresses for 20 years, which for me now doesn't really sound like that long a time, but it used to sound like forever. So, so what are these test masses? They're mirrors. They're, each one is 40 uh, kilograms of ultra pure fused silica, melted sand, just like most glass. But this is very special in its chemistry. It has low infrared absorption. Infrared is what we detect with our skin is uh, in, in the sunlight, what feels warm, we're detecting the infrared. We detect the uh, light with our eyeballs and we detect the uh, ultraviolet with our basal skin cells that then can get upset that they've had too much and fry. Um, and uh, so these, this glass only absorbs one in 3.3 million photons. So it's not gonna heat up. If it absorbed you know, one in 10, it would heat right up. Um, and then the coatings are polished to nanometer smoothness. Surface var variations of 10 to the minus ninth meters. So it's a very, very smooth surface. So here's the glass. Here you can see the technician uh, reflected in this and the, uh, uh, the light going down. And then here's where it hangs. And so you can see it's part of this great big contraption. And that is very deliberate. And that's what's taken 40 years to develop. Because LIGO can detect changes in any, either of the paths down to 10 to the ni minus 19th meters. That is a zero followed by 18 zeros and a one. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny distance. It's down to one ten thousandth of a proton. Weber was not going to detect this change in the diameter of his aluminum cylinder, no matter how hard he tried. That's what we can detect. But good grief, there's detections all over. There, there are vibrations all over the place. We have earthquakes, you know. We have uh, uh, trucks on roads. We have the LIGO staff jogging up and down the interferometer. All these little vibrations. Earth is a noisy place. Go, you, you know, you can go to Potsdam State or any university, go in, they have a seismometer. You can just go and look at the seismograph plotting out the jiggling of Earth, and it's constant. The pen is never just sitting there. It's always jiggling. Earth jiggles. So how are we going to deal with that? Because we want this thing to hang perfectly still until a gravitational wave comes along and expands and contracts every millimeter of space between the two mirrors by one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. So there is a seismic isolation system, and it works in two ways. One is active damping. This is like your noise canceling headphones because this shows here's some noise uh, source, you know, the person in the air, the, the airplane engines. Yeah, that's a good one. So the airplane engines. And so there's a little computer in the headphone, it detects the incoming noise, and it creates a wave. It detects it, of course, as, a, as an electromagnetic wave. It creates the opposite wave so that the two waves add to a flat line. So here it shows the bright orange is what's coming in, the brown is what the headphone creates, and so you get silence. So that's an active powered system. But there's also all this stuff hanging on here. That, oh, that creates destruct, uh, destructive interference. All that stuff is the passive damping. It's a four-stage pendulum called the quad. And it's got these metal masses, the first and the second pendulum. These absorb vibrations that aren't canceled by the active uh, cancellation system. 
And so it's got the penultimate mass, the third pendulum, the test mass is the fourth pendulum. And these things are hung on uh, 0.4 millimeter glass fibers. And the, the reason they use these glass fibers, you know, think of fiberglass fibers, they, they don't respond to temperature variations. And so it's not gonna move with variations in temperature. That's one of the reasons we don't want air in there because it expands and contracts with temperature. And so this is the system they've built and it's taken literally 40 years since they started building things, actually 60. No, 40, because they started building them in the 80s. So that's, it's been 60 since the 60s. So gravitational waves, the first detection was at 5.51 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on February 14, 2015. It was announced, they, they analyzed the data, they agreed on it, they figured out what had happened. They announced it on February 11, 2016. That was a remarkable day. I think I was actually in astronomy class when they had the, the news conference and I put it on and the students had no idea what they were talking about, but that's okay. I, I, I explained it to them. And so then the first multi-messenger detection was, uh, the detection was at 8.41 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 17, 2017, so two, two years later. Both LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and the Fermi Gamma Ray Satellite detecting not gravitational waves, but electromagnetic gamma rays, they detected it within milliseconds of each other. All of a sudden, we had information of two different kinds about an event in the cosmos. We had electromagnetic radiation, which we've been seeing for, you know, since we opened our eyes. But we also had gravitational, gravitational wave information about the same event. We've got two messengers about what's going on in the cosmos. Ah, oh, this is so exciting. So, oh, but that's for next time. So, the adventure continues. Ta -da! Wow. <laughs> All that for a bunch of hanging masses. And can you can you explain the 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 hanging on those such thin fiber glass fibers since they're not going to get jostled you know they're designed to hang pretty much perfectly still yeah they're thin fibers but they're very strong okay and wow. so and there's probably a but i there may be a bundle of them I see. Okay. I, and I, and they just said that they're the 0.4 millimeters. I'm thinking if they're 40 kilograms, it might be a bundle of those fibers, but they don't expand and contract on heating and cooling. That's the main thing. And that's the, that's the magic behind it. Yeah. And, you know, they started building these in the eighties and they have, you know, NSF uh, has funded this project for 40 years and it was really 40 years before they had a detection. You know, if I get NSF grants to observe and don't observe anything for 40 years, they're going to stop granting me money. So this was big. This took a lot of work by these physicists to keep convincing NSF that, no, 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 we really will detect them. We really will detect them. And it was, you know, frontline science. And uh, it's just, I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, a century after Einstein predicted these things. We detected him, and it, it partially it shows how advanced he was in his thinking, and just how hard these things are to do, because they kept building it. No detection, no detection, no detection. Improve it. No detection, no detection, no detection. Improve it. You know, a graduate student works on it, spends his entire professional career or her entire professional career with this instrument that never makes a detection. Yeah. The, just the, 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 the uh, perseverance of these physicists is, is pretty awesome. So 
uh, it, it, it's just a very exciting time in astronomy for learning about the cosmos right now. That's insane. That, that's such, uh, such a, a little amount of uh, movement to cause such a, a massive amount of excitement. Yes, one ten thousandth the diameter of a proton. Yeah. Wow. And tell me, is, is Weber, uh, is he still with us? I don't believe he is, no. You know, I should look it up. Was, was, was he at least alive to, uh, to know? I don't think so, but I'll, I'll have to look that up. Don't, don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, but one of the things I, I was uh, gonna say about getting a sense of the size of the proton is that um, a, a hydrogen atom is, of course, it's very tiny. Um, and if you expand the proton of a hydrogen atom up to the size of a golf ball, mm -hmm. the electrons of the hydrogen atom are 300 yards away. Mm. And they're like sesame seeds. A lot of, a lot of space in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, matter is empty space. Yeah. <laughs> and we're made of it. We're made of space. It's amazing. All space right. and fields. Okay. Well, any questions, any of you guys? I see a little bit of the participant list here, so. Yeah, if anybody has uh, anything, please unmute yourself and, uh, and, and ask away. I have a question. Yay! Uh, so this, uh, an event was recorded that something happened. Is there any clue as to what it was yes yes but that's that's the talk in october <laughs> ah okay it was it, yeah it was a merger of black holes cool so so yeah the, we detected big events and then we we detected the merger of of uh neutron stars so yeah there are more detections than i will tell you about but they're you know they're not all that frequent uh because it's big events, but all right. Anybody else? Thank you, Carol. Was that Carol that asked that? Yes, asked? that was Carol. Yep, uh, looking at the. I'm looking at the the um, uh, participant list, and my my cat has decided to join me. So if you see fur, it's it's <laughs> Benny, and he's keeping his tail just out of the camera right now. So oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Um, yes. Are the gravitational waves directional? Um, like, do they come through the atmosphere to those systems, or can yes. they go through the Earth and through right. those systems? But they are coming from the source. Yeah. And so, like the sunlight, you know, if the the sun exploded, that it would be, you know, a spherical. Um, uh, kind of a spherical sound wave, you know, like when I open my mouth and these hemispheres of, of, of vibrations go out. Um, uh, but if you're across the room, it comes from me to you. So this came from a particular direction and it's moving in a particular direction. So, yeah, like the flash of a, of, of a you know, a, a flashing light. It starts at the light and expands out. So Robert has his hand up. Oh, excellent. Yeah, just what do you, uh, you have a question, Robert? Maybe not. Robert, I think you are unmuted. Oh, there you went, went right back to mute. Yeah, now you're muted. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell when you're muted or unmuted. Now you're unmuted. Nope. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, it's not for Kara. I, I wanted to find out: um, Does this is this this instrument actually determine the direction that the gravitational wave came from? Because we have two of them, and I'll explain that next time. We have some idea. Um, it's uh, two of them is like your two ears. You can you can tell you know a, a particular direction because it hits one ear before the other. Um, you can't tell if it's directly in front or directly in back of you. Um, so yes, we have some detection. And now uh, more 
gravitational wave detection detectors are coming online. There's one in Italy. Um, and now we have three detectors. So now we can triangulate. Mm -hmm. And some more are uh, coming online. And once we have more, the direction, we'll be able to pinpoint better and better the direction where that event was. But with the multi-messenger detection, we had a gamma ray observatory and, and then x-rays and ultraviolet. And that, we know exactly where that happened because we had all those other detections of uh, the event. So um, approximately how much this costs as far as to build it? And, and uh, I mean, obviously it took 40 years, uh, but do you know how much it cost? No, nah, you know, I, I don't know. Probably, I don't know, I would guess uh, by the time all said was done, 100 million maybe, or, or, you know, a couple of hundred million. That would probably just in materials, I would think. Um, I, I would get, yeah, it, labor is probably the bigger thing. Yeah. And the land acquisition and the building and stuff, but um, yeah. Thank you. It's, the, the most expensive part was probably that uh, Hoover vacuum to suck out all of the air in the tunnel. <laughs> it's a Dyson. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention that, um, I guess that lens that was at the end of it, that was smooth. So nice. Oh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, mirror. But astronomers are really good at building mirrors and we have labs that are dedicated to that. University of Arizona, underneath the football stadium uh, 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 seating is their mirror lab where they make mirrors that are, you know, 10 meters in diameter. And uh, so they're very good. They have, they're very good with glass. Mm. So I would guess those little mirrors are not very expensive, given that we can make great big ones for great big telescopes. Right. So I had one more question. Okay. Uh, simple one. Um, what kind of signal to noise are you actually seeing for the detection? Of the oh, probably a factor of a few. Two, three? A, a few. You know, probably, you know, I would guess it's less than a signal to noise of 10. So less than, the signal is probably less than 10 times the noise. Thank These you. are tiny. That's what I thought because I think the background must be very variable. Over oh time. yeah, oh yeah. Even with all that work they've gone into to reducing the noise. But it's like, you know, me as a radio astronomer, you know, we cool our, our, our detectors with liquid helium and yet the galaxies, we're always pushing it to the faintest limits, right? So I'm always looking at galaxies that have a signal to noise of three, two, one and a half. And so, yeah, it's small uh, compared to the noise. And the time, how long, how long would you see that? Would it be intermittent with the wave? No, it's, it's like a, a ripple comes by and fades away. All right, so, you know, and I can't remember the time scale, but less than it, much less than a second. You know, the whole thing goes by in a millisecond or something, because it's moving at the speed of light. Right. <laughs> you know, it moves 186,000 miles in a second. <laughs> so the frequency of this, uh, of this um, wave is, is, uh, is it short or is it long? Um, like, is it like seconds per wave or no 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 they're they're a, a smaller frequency than that i can't remember the frequency um off the top of my head but next week we'll be I, i'll be able to answer that we'll see the frequency on the plot oh okay great i mean i've got a question here uh in the chat it says so is this used to locate objects or events in space you want to speak to that well yeah yeah, I mean, we don't have anything on Earth that's powerful enough to to create a gravitational wave. I mean, the the implosion of the Earth into a black hole would create a gravitational wave for us, but the universe wouldn't really notice. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's big events, way out in space. 
The ones we've detected are in distant galaxies, not even in our own galaxy. So this is a, a, an event-driven uh, occurrence. Yes. This is not yes. looking for new stars anyplace. This is no, we're not doing surveys of gravitational waves. We can't see them well enough. I and they're, they're, they're pretty unusual to have them big enough that we can detect them. You know, the question about signal to noise. Well, we've just beaten down the noise enough that we can get, we can, we can detect a signal of two black holes merging. Mm -hmm. All right. We probably couldn't detect this signal of Betelgeuse exploding. Well, Betelgeuse might be close enough. Maybe we'd see it. But, you know, most stars exploding wouldn't, it, we'd lose it in the noise. Right. So, so far we can only detect big events. Another few centuries, we'll probably be able to detect smaller events. But, you know, look, it took us, you know, 400 years to get from Galileo's spyglass to a gamma ray detector. So astronomers working over scales of hundreds of years is not new. Yeah. And that, I mean, if you think about it, that's a pretty speedy progress, if you ask me. Yeah, given how long it, it, it took us to invent a telescope. Mm -hmm. So... A couple of things I want to uh, just put out in the uh, in the chat area again, um, and that is, of course, we are building a uh, fifteen million dollar Astro Science Center museum, uh, planetarium, classroom, makerspace, uh, exhibits, and so forth. So, uh, this is a heavy lift for the Adirondack Sky Center. Uh, so, if you're interested, um, please consider a uh, a donation. Uh, the link to our direct site uh, to make that donation is right there. Another alternative is to call us or email directly info at adirondackskycenter.org or call us uh, directly 518-359-3538. More of information about all of this, uh, in particular our capital project, uh, can be found right on our website at uh, Adirondack Sky Center dot org and on our Facebook page which is where a lot of um, uh, information about uh, the fundraising or these lectures stargazing all sorts of things uh, located there um, our YouTube channel as I uh, mentioned and uh, Eileen mentioned earlier this lecture will be posted there tomorrow morning and uh, of course, again, our email address if you're interested in uh, contacting uh, us directly, info at adirondackskycenter.org. My email address is there also. Feel free to, uh, oops, let me try that one more time. My email address is there also, but uh, info will uh, go to our general mailbox and you can, uh, you'll be able to reach me or anybody through that link. And finally, uh, before we take the last of our questions, coming up next week is uh, Jeff Miller with the Skinny on the Facts and Myths of the Equinox. And uh, as a participant tonight, as always, you get the early registration link. So uh, get in on the action of the Equinox, find out what's real, what's not real, and what's the deal with the egg on the equinox. <laughs> so uh, tune in, there's the link right there in the chat area. Uh, this will be posted on our Facebook page and, uh, and, and so forth, so. Um, yeah, just let me uh, speak up and say, I, I put my email uh, address, aodonahue at stlyu.edu um, in the uh, chat too. If somebody wants to, to ask a question via email, feel free. Excellent, excellent. So, so let's, uh, let's see if there's any more questions before we wrap up for the evening. I got a quick question. Um, do they know are gravitational waves uh, subject to the Doppler effect? Ooh. Like electromagnetic waves are? Um, boy, I have to think about that because the Doppler uh, effect yeah, is our motion away from the source mm -hmm. through space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to answer that next time. Jeez. Hey. Thanks. That's a good question. Okay. We got a softball, though. What's your cat's name? <laughs> oh, that was Benny. Okay. Yeah. And his sister is, is part of our family, too. And her name is Willa. But she doesn't like to Zoom. She's shy. Benny <laughs> always likes to come up and show off his tail when I Zoom because he's very proud of his tail. It's a cool looking tail. It is. He's a pretty cat. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Does anything slow these things, these waves down? No. They continue moving at the speed of light. Uh, that's it. They're not absorbed by anything. They're not refracted. You know, a gravitational wave, if you used a gravitational wave to look at a spoon in a glass, it wouldn't look bent. Wow. So, um, yeah. They're, they're very elusive critters. And the fact that we can detect them, it's just awesome. It's, uh, yeah. So I had one more question on this too. Okay. Would you speculate that in the future that these detection systems would be set up on other planets to gain different types of information than what we're just getting now? I don't I don't think we put it on, in, on other planets where they have all those vibrations. I think we put them in space. Just in space. Yeah. I mean, just put them, uh, you know, in a in a couple of uh, different uh, satellites that that orbit the Earth opposite each other or something. So we could be doing that now. Uh, well, yeah, it's except it's pretty, you know, the engineering of the the uh, four kilometer uh, path is still a little daunting in space. But certainly, you know, I mean, look. You know, a commercial company is putting up these systems of satellites. And, and so, you know, we've got a satellite that's hanging around near the sun now, taking pictures of it, you know, and it's just above the, the surface of the sun. So, you know, yeah, certainly that's in the future. And uh, considering it's been 40 years, NSF might have some other promises to keep in funding, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they have no problem with breaking promises, believe me. <laughs> they are let uh, they are able to uh drop projects when they're not really sexy anymore. Oh wow. So Last Which is a, it's a continuing argument in astronomy. Do you keep funding the old stalwart instruments? Or do you say, okay, find your own funding. We're going to fund this new um, instrument that may or may not be successful. Mm -hmm. And it is always a tension. Yeah. Last call. Anybody else have uh, anything they'd like to ask? Well, thank you, everyone who pinged in. I really appreciate you, uh, uh, you know, spending your Friday evening listening to me. Well, Eileen, thank you so much. What a great and exciting uh, topic to choose. And uh, it, it's always an adventure. Uh, it is. And, uh, and, and I'm glad to know that the, con the adventure continues. One more time, at least, uh, in, on, on yes. Columbus Day weekend, I think it is. Yes. Thank okay. you so much for being here, and um, and we look forward to that uh, the final chapter in your three part series. So okay, cool. And thanks everybody for being here tonight. Don't forget to uh, look us up online, give us a call or drop us an email. Let us know what you think of this lecture series. The Cygnus lecture series will continue through uh, mid October, and then we'll we'll do some throughout the winter and the uh, spring as well, but not on a weekly basis. So thanks for being here, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in person uh, as soon as we can. Good night, everybody. Thanks for hosting, Seth. Good night, everyone. Good night.